Hey everybody, welcome back to this series where I go through various RPG products that I have, give them a quick flip through and review, and just talk about them generally. Today I'm going to be going through three RPG setting or systems I should say. Um, old school and very simple, very small, but um, in one case literally, <laughs> but uh, I think really really awesome, each in their own distinct ways. Um, now I have the physical copies for two of these, or rather I had the physical copy for one of them, and the other one is coming, so I don't actually have them to flip through. But I'll, I have the PDFs, and so I'll click through them here. The first one is the Electrum Archive by Emil Boban. I think how you say that. Um, and this is issue one. Issue two has been kickstarted. I've kickstarted it, and it, um, we have the uh, er early copy of it already. It's being playtested and finished, so it's not done yet. I want to click through his initial offering. Um, you can also find a free version of the rules with all of the first part of the rules, just online for free. But you can get the Electrum Archive. Um, I'll have links below to all these, obviously. This is a great science fantasy role-playing game. It's both a setting and a system. And I think some people have talked about it and, and, and it's been out there a little bit, but I wanted to give it a quick flip through, especially in contrast or in, in comparison to the next two I'm gonna go through, because there's some similarities and some differences. Um, first of all, the art is great throughout um, and the setting is really interesting. I'm not gonna go into the setting in too, too much detail, but there are a lot of really cool details about it here. The world is Orn and uh, the, the art, the. Uh, the whole thing is, is a great vibe. I like it a lot. Um, the PDF here is about 70 pages, and uh, it's, it's well well spent. Those 70 pages are well spent. There's a lot of good information packed on here. Uh, there's a foreword with a note on science fantasy, which I think is really cool, because uh, a lot of us are familiar with, with more medieval fantasy, more you know, regular, uh, fa regular fantasy. <laughs> and so there's an element of sci-fi here. And so science fantasy is a, it's a, an interesting... Um, setting, style, an interesting genre, and uh, we often don't know it so well. So he gives you a quick note on that. And then a seven point note on the world. I think, uh, seven point notes, how would you say that? Seven notes, seven points. <laughs> Regardless, it's awesome. Uh, I like I like this a lot. I, I, I can really enjoy sitting down and digging into a really big text on somebody's world, if it's a good world, if it's interesting. But for ease of you, something like this is, is the way to go. Here's a brief primer on what the world is. You could give this to your players, right? Here's what you know about the world. Go for it. There's a good play example right away. Helpful to have. And then character creation. Now this system uses, uh, it's a roll under system and you're gonna see all of the ones I'm, I'm presenting today are roll under systems, which <laughs> it's funny that I keep saying I don't like them and yet most of my games are roll under systems. But you know, leave that, be that as it may. These are, they're all interesting roll under systems and they do things in an interesting way. So the attributes you have are, there's just five of them, but it's basically the standard D&D attributes just renamed. Uh, Agility is dexterity. Archive is basically intelligence. Body is both strength and con put together. Mask is charisma, but it also has the element of stealth added into it. So they take that out of dexterity and add that into to, uh, charisma, basically, mask. Some people are going to really like that. That's a cool change. It's a combination to hide everything, one ability. But some people are going to find that to be less useful. You could easily move stealth over back to agility if you wanted, um, depending on the circumstance, perhaps. And then spirit, which is wisdom, essentially. Now, the way that you generate your stats is you roll a d4 for each of them. And then you roll 2d4 to determine your starting hit points. So your stats are between 1 and 4. And the roll under system is still... Uh, uh, a, you still are trying to roll under that ability. But you roll d10s rather than d20s. So at, at, at worst, you're going to have a 10% chance to succeed. At best, you're going to have a 40%. Well, actually not quite, because you can get uh, bonuses to your stats at level 1 via your background. So at max, you could have a 60 or rather a six in an ability attribute, which would be a 60% chance to succeed. Um, you you pick, you roll for those, then you choose a background. And the backgrounds are essentially, it's a way of getting a, you could roll randomly, a D8 table um, would get you what you want, but you can also just pick. And that gives you bonus to a couple of your attributes, plus talents, which are essentially your skills. If you try something in an area that you're talented in, you get an advantage on the check. So you roll twice and take the lower. And then you get languages. The trade tongue is the common tongue, but then everybody has their own specific language they can get. Sometimes, I guess, the worker doesn't get an extra language, for example. Neither does the performer. Then you choose an archetype, which is your, basically your class. And there are three classes that correspond roughly to uh, thief, fighter, and uh, mage, magic user. Um, then you get equipment. And equipment is really interesting. Um, it have a very small number of things you can carry. You can carry two things in your hands, two things on your body, and six in your backpack, and that's it. And then you get, um, like you can't, 
be encumbered at all. If you want to carry more than that, you have to have like a cart or an animal or a, or a you know hireling or something like that. Um, and then inventory uses a pip system so that when you run out of, or a, you know, a, a usage dot system, so that when you use an item, you mark a, a usage dot off of it under certain circumstances, you mark it as used. And then when all three of them are used up, that item is gone. You have to replace it or repair it. Um, money is interesting too. Money isn't the, the setting. He makes it very clear that gold and silver are just everywhere. And so you use ink instead of gold and silver. Ink is sort of like spice from Dune. It's the thing that powers everything. It's currency, but it also is how magic users get access to their spells. So drops, which is coins essentially, that's the base unit of currency. And so everything, all the inventory, um, all the equipment is, is, you know, in terms of drops, you get experience based, or you can get experience based on how many drops you can recover. And uh, also, if you're a magic user, you use drops to cast spells. So I could definitely see a situation where everybody's getting their drops, um, using what they need to buy as a bare minimum, and then passing everything else to the magic user of the party, because drops are how they power their magic. It's kind of an interesting idea to use the currency that you use elsewhere also for your magic. I kind of like that. Then you get a name. So here are the backgrounds. Archivist, Houseborn, Muscle, Nomad, Cultist, Performer, Scavenger, and Worker. The world is really interesting too. I'll talk about that in a bit, but it's essentially um, a post-apocalyptic sort of. I mean, there are these like noble houses that, that run things in the civilized areas, and there are these very dangerous trade routes that go between them, and uh, there are these spore plagues that had you know, bone plagues that are interesting like bone mushroom things that are going around and uh, it's, it's really cool and you have to like prepare yourself to not be infected by those and all that so the first of the archetypes the uh, the archetype is the fixer it's, just, it's the skilled the thief thiefy kind of person and uh, when you level up you just simply get more skills um, and skills give you an ability and then when you level up again uh, you can choose to master that skill or to pick a new one, right? So you can just uh, start uh, uh, piling up your expertise, which I think is pretty cool. So you can pick Swift, but then you can master your swiftness. You can pick Network, but then you can master that network. So it's a cool way of doing that. Um, you have the Vagabond, which is the, the warrior, essentially. They're kind of like battle masters from 5th edition, so you get um, maneuvers you can do, and you use Grit to... Uh, to, to, to use those maneuvers and you get more grit as you level up and you learn more maneuvers as you level up. That's a cool thing. They don't get a ton of anything else. They don't get extra hit points. They don't get extra tough or anything like that. Uh, but they just get more tech tricks that they can use in combat. And then there's the warlock, which is the, the caster. And spells are kind of done in a maze rat style where they, you roll randomly for the spell name and then you kind of have to negotiate with the DM about what it does. But there's also a, a, an ability to spend more or f fewer or more drops in, in order to make the spell of a different power level. So you have minor spells, which just takes a few drops. So you can, so you, you'll roll a spell and you'll see it's like blazing, you know, blazing arc or something like that. And you just use it in a minor way. It might create a, a light or something like that, right? But if you use it in a major way, it might be this huge, you know, inferno, wall of inferno, <laughs> uh, uh, fiery inferno, wall of flame that just incinerates everybody. That's gonna cost a lot of drops to use. So the spell name is the same, but then you can, as a player, can choose how much you want to invest in that spell. And then you and the DM kind of decide what it does. That's kind of cool. I like that. And so level one, you get random spells. At level two, you kind of sense where ink is. And then at level three, you can start to hold spells that you already know, hold parts of the name, and add them into new spells. So you kind of get, um, you kind of get what you're trying to do. Um, and then you get extra spells randomly at level seven. So, so it's really cool, really cool. Um, attribute checks, it's pretty simple. As I said, it's a roll under system, but it's a D10 system, which means it's pretty hard to succeed. You don't want to roll unless you absolutely have to, because for most of your talents, you're probably going to have between three and four at level one, or where you're really good. You could have six if you rolled well in your talent in the area of expertise and you picked a background that, that suits that area. But you're, I would say, probably not usually going to have a six. You're probably going to have you know, three or two, maybe, 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 maybe four. So you're unlikely to succeed unless you have advantage. So you, you want to be careful about doing things unless you have to. You want to be clever about doing things that you don't have to roll. Talents are a way of getting yourself advantage on particular kinds of checks. And equipment also, if you have the talent and the equipment, you can just automatically succeed sometimes. You don't have to roll. It's just that sort of thing. Uh, time is pretty straightforward. Zones of combat, there's a cool visualization of how the zones work. Speed rolls is an interesting idea. Essentially, if you, at the start of every round, you make a speed roll, and if you roll higher than, than what you need to roll, 
uh, then you act after the enemy. If you roll lower than what you need to roll, you roll before the enemy. And what you need to roll depends upon the weapon you're using. So if you're going to use a weapon, it has a speed attribute, and you have to roll under that. Otherwise, you just roll under five. And then if you roll under five, you act first. If you if you roll over, uh, you, you go after the enemy. And um, that's kind of an interesting way of doing it. I can see this slowing things down, but combat is also pretty fast uh, because you don't roll to hit. You auto always hit. You just subtract armor value. Um... If you have advantage, you roll high and to take twice and take the higher. If you disadvantage, you roll and take the lower. Critical hits are when you roll maximum on your die and you just skip armor. So if you roll, if you have a D8 damage, you roll an eight. You just do all eight damage to the enemy and you skip their armor production. It makes it a very lethal system. And we're gonna see this is a lethal, lethal game. Enemies can kill you so quick and you can kill enemies real quick too. Um, dual wielding basically gives you advantage. You use the lower speed among them, but you roll damage both and choose which result to keep. So you kind of have advantage in a way. You can aim, so you can skip your attack this round to ignore armor value next round. Uh, and then disengaging in stunts, just anything else you kind of want to do there. Backpacks, takes an action to get an item out of your backpack. Harm and healing, so it's really deadly. When you get to zero hit points, you roll a d6, and on a 1, 2, or 3, you just die. So you have a 50% chance of death every time you fall unconscious. On a 4 or above, you are unconscious, and you have a turn for them to save you. Now, in combat, that's, um, uh, that's a round, as far as I can tell. You have a turn. Um, outside of combat, that would be a 10 minute, I guess, if you have a like, fall. You have like 10 minutes, one turn for them to get to you. And if you don't get tended to, if someone has to make an archive check, and if they succeed, then you're fine. If they fail, you just die. So it's so likely to die. First 50% chance of just death outright. Then if you don't die outright, you have a round, essentially, for them to get to you to make a check. And if they don't get to you, you die. And if they fail the check, you die. So it's so lethal. If you survive, you wake up one hit point, and you still have a scar, and the scars are rough. There are things like losing a body, losing a leg. The next time you roll on Death Store, you die on a one through five. Um, you lose an arm. You have, you have all the t damage rolls with range attacks are at disadvantage because of a lost eye. Permanently reduce your hit points by two. These are rough things. So, if, I mean, it's just, it's, it's brutal. This is a really brutal game. You're going to be losing characters and bringing them back in, I think, a lot. Uh, some people are going to love that. Healing, short rest, takes a turn. Mark a usage sign on a ration, make an archive check, and you heal. So you don't just heal automatically on a short rest. You have to use rations, and then you get to make a check. So archive seems really important. You're going to need a healer in the party. And there's no cleric class. So you're not going to get healing from that unless you happen to have spells uh, that, that, that can be used as healing. There's deprivation, which is exhaustion and attribute drain, as you might expect. And then there's advancement, how you level up. And leveling up is interesting. Basically, there are different criteria. If you find treasure, if you complete a goal, if you find useful things about the world, if you establish meaningful relationships with a faction or NPC, and if you survive death, you roll dice in each of those categories. But you only choose one die to use. So basically, if you find treasure and you learn something useful about the world, and say you found uh, over 300 drops, you'd roll a D8 and you'd roll a D4. And you take the higher number and that's how much experience you get. So experience seems to go up pretty slowly. You don't level up very fast because you need five times your current level to level up. So, I mean, I guess that's actually not bad. At level one, you could level up at pretty easily after one session, especially if you did something like find a lot of treasure. 300 drops, that's a D8. Yeah, I guess that's actually pretty fast. But then it's going to go up mad hard, right? So level two, you need 10. Level three, you need 15. Um, now, it doesn't say, I would assume those reset. Yeah, it has to reset. Otherwise, it's just five every time. <laughs> so it resets. So it gets harder and harder to level up and slower down. Um, and when you level up, you can choose to gain two hit points and increase an attribute by one, or you can increase two attributes by one. So you don't get that much when you level up, and you get some class features when you level up as well, your archetype features. You can never get above eight, you never go below one. So you always have at least an 80%, uh, at best, an 80% chance of success, and at worst, a 10% chance of success. Although he does say that you can get up to 90, you can get a 9 in an ability based on certain bonuses that might come up in an actual check, but you can never have a natural ability above 8. Here's the items as I talked about. You have usage dots. They use them up after you use them. Uh, how many slots you have and how to transport things, how drops are carried and how you can store more. Up to 100 drops to fit a slot, but there are ways of getting, there is a way of getting more drops than that on your person by using banks, essentially. Toolkits, transport, weapons, uh, rare weapons, armor and shields, and then spells. As you can see, there's a lot of cool ideas. Uh, when you generate a spell, you roll a d4 and then 2d8. So this is right out of Maze Rats um, and other games like that. And then it's up to you and the DM to kind of figure out what they do. And then 
you can choose to make them more or less potent by how much, how much, how many drops you use. And you roll when you cast it in that way. So you could roll really low or really high. So I could do a, a minor casting and it costs eight drops. It's like, ugh. Or I could do a moderate casting and it takes three drops. Um, so it's, it's pretty expensive. Uh, a mythic casting is 44 times 15. So it's really hard to cast them. So you need a lot of drops. Travel and exploration, exploration, travel times, how that works. And then a brief timeline of the history of the world with the world itself, the regions, the people, the languages, the religion. Uh, and in how hard it is to understand people who speak other languages. That's kind of cool. I like that. What ink is and where it comes from and how it works. Are there different factions? You can do the blind bank. Uh, there's a lot of Dune influence here, I think. Um, it's even a desert world-ish. You get the different locations. It's sort of a point crawl, how you get from place to place. Um, different locations and what might be there, plot encounters, uh, and the different regions in the world and the locations that are there. So there are, you know, sorry, there's Electrum Sea, there's the Myrdal, Myrdal Delta, the Rift, the Runland, Ruin Lands, etc. You go through and there's different locations there, plot hooks and counters that you can find there. NPCs and monsters in the back of the book, an NPC generator, there's a loot the body table, uh, along with bone spores and what the spores do, and then inspirations behind the whole thing. Yeah, Dune by Frank Herbert's one of them, I'm sure, and a whole bunch of other things. All right, so great little book. Um, you can get all the rules for free, and if you're interested in them, you can go beyond them and go into the um, the uh, um, the actual rules, the actual uh, setting itself with the Electrum Archive Issue 1, and Issue 2 is currently being produced. So it'll be out relatively soon. Again, I have the playtest version of that, uh, but I haven't gone through it in too much detail, and I don't know how finalized it'll, you know, how much it'll change before the final version. But anyway, I recommend this one highly. I'll put the links to it below. The next one is something that a lot of people are familiar with. That's Mouse, Mouse Ritter. Mouse Ritter is such a great little setting. I've had a lot of fun with this. I used to have the box setting. I gave it away to my nephew because he loved it so much. Um, and he plays it all the time with his sister and with his uh, other brother. It's just a great um, a great little setting. Mouse Ritter is essentially a Sword, a sword and Whiskers role-playing game. It's by Isaac Williams. And it is really a kind of hack of Into the Odd along with a couple other things. But there's great ideas here. And the tone and the vibe of it is perfect. Um, I highly recommend getting this one physically if possible. The physical copy is awesome. It's uh, The box set is great. And it also comes with a lot of the extra stuff that you would kind of have to make on your own that make the game fun, especially for younger players. So um, this is a pretty... Uh, it's for younger players, but it's a pretty brutal setting. It's pretty lethal. It's pretty hard. So you got to have to know your, your, your players here. You could make it less lethal if you wanted to, but it's a hard game. Again, you could, you could pull back on that if you wanted, but... You don't have to. There's a very vibrant community for this, by the way. There's a good Discord community that, that has a lot of extra material, great art and inspiration. So this is one where if you pick up this game and jump into the community, you'll find a lot of, of people already there doing a lot of great work. But there's really good um, basic ideas. This is on just the front page of what you can have. Uh, basic uh, information on the front, front page of the book or the, the cover pages of the book. Uh, credits and table of contents. Brave Mice in a Dangerous World. What is Mouse Ritter? What is a role-playing game? What you need to play? Dice Notation. How to read this book and making it your own. So, um, what is a role-playing game? Again, I don't know how important that is. But the, but this is more appealing to younger players. And I could see someone picking this box off the shelf and be like, Oh, this looks cute. I'm going to buy this for my my child or my, my son or, you know, something like that. And then it, you know, they've never played a game like this before. So I could see that being important. And it's only that little bit, so I don't mind it so much. But for most of us, we don't need to know what a role-playing game is. Um, this is how you make your character. Once again, you have three attributes. That's like a lot of old systems. Strength, dex, and will. It's a roll-under system, and to make them, you roll 3d6, and you keep the two highest for 2 to 12. Uh, and then you can swap any two attributes. And uh, then you have hit points, pips, and background. And so hit points is hit protection. This is taken a lot from Into the Odd. All this stuff is from Into the Odd. And then uh, d6 is your starting money. And then you use your hit points and your money to determine your starting background. And then the, that will determine what your starting items are. So there's a little bit of in, built-in balance. If you have very few hit points and money, you're going to start with better items. More hit points, more money, you'll have worse items. And if you roll really badly for your attributes, you're going to get more extra items too. So you get additional items if your attributes are low. So that's actually pretty cool too. So if you roll a really bad mouse, you're going to get a lot more stuff. And therefore, you'll be more useful to start out. You get some details, like a birth sign, with it has a disposition attached to it if you need some help role-playing your character. You get coats and physical details. 
and then the different backgrounds are delightful. From test subject, <laughs> all the way down to the popper noble mouse. Uh, inventory is one of the fun elements of this game. It's, it's actually kind of like a, a little mini game. It's like a little, um, uh, not, not, a, not Jenga, what's the word I'm looking for there? Like a puzzle, not even a puzzle. But basically you have to actually fit the different items into your inventory page. And if you buy the game in, in a physical form, you have all of that stuff already pre-made. So you have your character sheets and the, the inventory uh, little page, and then you have pop out or cut out tokens that you can put into those slots. So it's really cool, especially again, for younger players, they, I think they tend to find it a lot of fun to actually maneuver and figure out how to fit things into their inventory, especially once you start getting two slot items or, or you, could, you could make your own like L-shaped items, or you could do fun things like that, right, to make it interesting. And, Conditions take up slots so that as you get hungry or injured, you have fewer inventory slots. Um, that's an idea that I think is, is built really into something like Crown and Skull, right? Where you, as you get injured, you lose your ability to use items. This is kind of like that, but instead of losing the item directly, you lose the slot. And so you kind of have to choose what you're losing. Weapons and armor are really simple. Um, you automatically hit when you attack. So damage reduction, armor, there's no armor class. It's just damage reduction. So dice do, um, weapons do different things. You can choose, there's not like a whole inventory list of weapons, you just get, you know, light weapons or heavy weapons or light ranged weapons. And they do just, just their set things. And you can describe it how you want. Um, pips and, and pips is the money system that you use. There's a pip purse, rations, and torches. How to pay, how to play, very simple, but it's a, it's a hard system. So you only roll a save if you, if there's sort of a risk or the outcome is uncertain and the failure has consequences, then you'll have to roll a save. And if you, it's a roll under system and you're, 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 you know, your attributes are between two and 12. So you're not likely to succeed unless you have advantage. Um, so you don't really want to have to roll. Once again, just like the Electrum Archive, you kind of want to minimize the times that you have to roll. So you want to plan a lot, uh, you know, make it a foregone conclusion that of course you can succeed at whatever you're trying because if you just leave it up to chance, it could be really bad. Combat is also really lethal and he warns you about that, that uh, because there's no, to hit roll, you're just always doing damage and uh, mice don't have a lot of hit points and often you're fighting things like giant snakes or giant spiders. Well, giant relative to the mice, you know, the, reg the regular size mice and regular size snakes, but they feel giant. Um, hit points or hit to, uh, protection. Once that goes to zero, then you start losing strength. And once that goes to zero, you die. And every time you take strength damage, you kind of have to roll to, to stay awake and to stay alive and not take an injured condition, which again, goes into your inventory. And if you're left untended for six exploration turns, you die, so an hour. You have an hour basically outside of combat if you're incapacitated to survive. They have to get to you before, they, before you die. Um, rest and healing and how that works. Time, overland travel, and advancement, how you level up here. Um, okay, oh, then grit. You can use grit to ignore conditions. Um, you get grit as you level up and you can keep going. Magic is one of the cool systems in this game. Magic uses a dice sum system. And so basically all of your spells are um, on scrolls or tablets. And each of those tablets has three usages. And so you can choose when you cast it, how you, um, how you use it. And then, um, each of the spells has a different effect depending on how many dice you use and what you roll on those dice. So fireball, for example, which is shoot a fireball up to 24 inches, uh, deal some plus dice damage to all creatures within six inches. Or uh, another example would be um, darkness. Create a sum times two diameter sphere of pure darkness for dice turns. So that's really cool and you can sort of choose how, how far you go. For every six you roll, you, have, you take damage. Um, so you want to be careful uh, when you cast really big spells because it can hurt you. Um, and then what's really cool is that to recharge the spell, you have to do something really special with that spell book or with that spell tablet. So to cast Fireball, you have to burn the tablet in the heart of a raging fire for three days and nights, and then it recharges and you can use it again. So magic is not, you know, if you're going to be a caster, you're going to be someone who has a whole bunch of these things in your inventory, and that'll mean you can't use a lot of equipment. So that's the sort of like knave in that sense where it's classless, and depending on what you carry and how you play and what your abilities are, uh, and how many spells you wish to carry. You can kind of be more fighter, thief, or, or magic user, but it's not a hard class system. Obviously, because you're mice, you need help, and so there's going to be a lot of those rules for hirelings and warbands and, and constructing your, your, your uh, keeps, your, your strongholds. Good example of play. And then GM resources, and there's some really good GM resources in here that I've used this a lot. Good advice for how to run a game like this. 
and when you should be you do when you should do what you should do, like asking for saves and the consequences of failure. Um, reaction tables, weather tables, and creatures. I love the creatures here. Um, perfectly suited for a game like this, where you're a bunch of mice. You've got other mice, but you've got ghosts and frogs and crows and fairies and cats and centipedes and owls and spiders and snakes and rats. Lots of really cool basic uh, creatures. And there are different options for each of them. So say you run into a rat, each of the rats, you have a D6 table for the rat gang and what makes them special. Or the snake, what kind of strange snake is this? Or the owl, you know, which owl sorcerer is this? <laughs> I think that's awesome. And then there's a hex crawl tool toolbox, which is really great. A really, really useful uh, how to create a, a little hex crawl for it, how to do factions, and a simple way of making sure factions are progressing. Um, and then a, an example hex crawl, which is the Oldham of Eck. Um, and then how to create adventures, and how to randomly stock them, treasure, magic items, and then an example adventure site, which is Stumpsville, a place which has been taken over by evil rats. Quick rules reference at the end of the book, and then great art. So I really recommend Mouse Herder. If you guys have never heard of it, which I would be surprised, but if you guys have never heard of it, I hope this has been um, a, kind of an interesting introduction to it. But I really recommend this one, and especially recommend buying it in the box set, if at all possible. Mouse Herder is an excellent little system. Now, the last one I want to cover is something that's very different and pretty funny. It's something I just kickstarted, and uh, it is called Perils and Princesses. It's a new game that just came out. It's coming out. The print version isn't even actually out yet. Um, this is a fantastic little game. Very different than the other two. Well, actually, it's very similar to them in system, but it's absolutely different in that the other games are pretty lethal, especially the Electum Archive. This game is... It's so hard to actually die as a character. And that's because I think it's intended for children, for introductions to this game, especially for... I mean, I would imagine the intended target audience is girls. But, you know, they have... Obviously, anyone can play this. But it's definitely intended for people who like Disney princesses and that sort of thing. But it's a funny little system. I'm definitely going to try playing this with my nieces. Um, I'll run through it really quickly. So you have virtues, which are your abilities. You have three virtues, three stats, resolve, grace, and wits. It's a roll under system. 20s always fail, one always succeeds. Um, and if you have advantage, you roll two and take the lower. Disadvantage, you two roll two, take the higher. You have gift dice, which is how you use spells. You get gift, gift dice as you level up, and depending on particular circumstances and classes. Uh, and it does sort of the mouse ritter sum dice thing. But instead of having like pips that you mark off or tokens that you mark off, on a one, two, three, you get your dice back. Four, five, six, you use it up. And if you double it, then you have to roll on a mishap. Heart dice, which are essentially ways of your, your, your hit dice. You heal um, during a short rest, which they, this game calls a picnic. Or you can use them to help other people who fail, cast, or fail checks and things. So you can spend your hit dice, your heart dice, to help other people, help other players. I think that's really cool. Then there's initiative, which is a wit test. And if you succeed, you get to go first. If you fail, you go after. And if you roll one, then you perform two actions. Fighting is really straightforward. Uh, you have to roll to hit, which is resolve, hit, and then a grace test for ranged. If you succeed, you roll dice. Rolling a one is a critical, and you roll two dice and add them together. And then you roll to defend, so the creatures don't roll to attack. So a creature will choose to attack you, and then you as a player roll to defend. It's a grace test. And then you subtract armor from any damage. And 20 is a crit for the enemy, and you ignore your armor value. Antics are just anything else. And you get a reaction per turn. This is just the quick start rules, but the, the game has more detail about all this stuff later. Recovering. Uh, a picnic is a short break. You spend time, which is a resource, the game says, when you, you can choose to spend time and then stuff might happen during that period. And then you can spend hard dice to recover hit points and consume a meal. Uh, rest is an uh, eight-hour break in a safe place. You consume a meal, restore all hit points, uh, heart dice, and gift dice. You have encumbrance, straightforward encumbrance there. Um, but I think things like this are really funny, and this is throughout the whole game. It says, only items big enough that would hurt, uh, uh, let's see, only items big enough that they would hurt if dropped on your toe. That's all that counts against an encumbrance. So if it drops on your toe, uh, it, it, uh, it counts as an encumbrance item. It would hurt. <laughs> I think that's just funny. Uh, there's ailments, so you have, uh, weary, woozy, and befuddled, and if you have those conditions, then you have disadvantage on those particular kinds of tests. Wrinkles, which are, you know, random encounters, setbacks, complications. You roll them when time is spent. And then distances are at hand, nearby, stone's throw, and over yonder. And then wounds, and this is what I meant by wounds and trauma, and this is what I meant by this game is really easy in terms of you're not going to die. So when you reach zero hit points, you cannot act or move until you're stabilized, and then you roll a d8 on the wounded table. And the wounded tables are mostly positive. 
Like just a flesh wound hurt, but becoming battle hardened. Once you're healed, your max hit points increases by one. What doesn't kill you, weary, but uh, for three days, but after which you resolve increases by one. Rattled, but woozy until you have a picnic or rest. Then you get scared or clonked or cracked or lingering injury, and it heals. And once you heal, you add a d4 to your max hit points. Only if you roll an eight do you get traumatized. And if you take double damage in your max hit points, you take trauma. But even trauma, you have three points. And if you get traumatized once, you can't use your gift dice for 24 hours. If you traumatize twice, you can't use your hit dice for 24 hours. And you're terrified of the source of your trauma. So disadvantage around that until you overcome your fear. And then three, it's all over. And they say potential outcomes are retirement, magical slumber, capture, tragic death, or other at, and at the table's discretion. So at everybody's discretion. So death is only one of the possibilities if you roll a bunch of trauma points after you've... I mean, it's really hard to, to, to die. But that makes sense because this game isn't hardcore. It's not for hardcore players. It's for young players. Um, and it's for people who, you know, I would say mostly girls who tend to not be into RPGs at a young age, especially, you know, just in my experience. This would be a way of bringing them into the, the idea, but you love Disney princesses, let's play a game where you're a Disney princess. And here is a way you're not going to die before the end of the adventure. You're probably not going to die at all. So I think that's a good rule for the, the, the intended target audience. But that's just all on the front page. It's a brief rundown of the whole game. The art in this game is what I really love, as well as just the, the tone. It's just so whimsical and so cute. Definitely something that I would play um, with kids. And have Once Upon a Time, and what is this? Uh, and then you have the core principles, gritty and petty. <laughs> Mundane is magic. Rulings over rules, multiple solutions. Painting the full picture, failing forward, playing the role, and telling a story. So you can tell it's definitely not the gritty, you know, OSE, shadow dark, death is around every corner kind of game. It's not what this is. Although the mechanics are very similar to those sorts of games, which is why I think it's an interesting creation. It shows you that there's a lot of uh, flexibility in those, those basic ideas. So to create your princess, because you're all a princess, you don't have to be. It says here you could be a governor or a sister or a squire or a cotter or a goodman or a dame, but you're probably a princess. And you have your name and your title, and then you have your fairy godmother, because of course you have a fairy godmother and what they're like. And you have your gift. This is your class, essentially. Um, the classes are Wild Heart, Enchanting Voice, Sprightly Agility, Elemental Connection, Kitchen Magic, Healing Touch, Powerful Friendship, and Sage Intellect. You can choose or you can roll, but you have one of these classic Disney princess adventures. Wild Heart, right? So you um, can speak to animals and intuit their feelings. There's enchanting voice, so you can mimic and you can sing, and people listen to you and they love your, their voice. You have sprightly agility. Uh, you have an elemental connection. Again, kitchen magic, healing touch, powerful friendship, or the sage intellect. Um, so you pick your class, then you roll for your virtues, which are your four stats, 4d4 four in order, and then you can re-roll a stat or swap, and, or swap to it says. So it's really generous. 4d4 four means you're you know, 4 to 16, but you're probably going to be somewhere around 10. For a roll-under system, that makes sense, but you can re-roll and you can swap, so you get the character you, that you want, and it's probably not going to be terrible. Heart points go up, and again, hit points. Um, D4 plus 4. And then your personality... Uh, if you want to roll that at first glance, those close to me think, secretly deep down, I, and then what really motivates you. So it's an interesting uh, way of doing your personality quickly if you want. And then you have talents. Talents are just what you get advantage on when you take tests, sort of like skills. Um, every, uh, every gift, every class has a set of talents, but then also there's a talent table that you get for a hidden talent. Encumbrance and how you do that, and then you roll for random equipment. And I love this. You're dressed like, and it shows you what you're dressed And this cool clip art, not clip art, but old art used here. Um, armor and shields and what they do. What's in your purse? And you roll a d20 on each column and you always, you get extra items there. And then you can choose a bonus item depending on what you roll. And then you get a weapon. And it's a particular weapon, a frying pan, a parasol. But then there's, you know, a battle axe and a flail and an oak staff. Um, perils, which is how to play. This is for the DM mostly. Virtue test center. It goes through that information that I basically laid out before and what they are. But it goes out in more detail with great art and other, other things like that. Um, adventures and the sorts of adventures you're going to run into. Spending time and wrinkles and ideas for wrinkles for the DM here. Exploration and how to do it. To push it, navigating, getting lost. Light, searching, and treasure. How to fight. Um, fight's really uh, straightforward, as I laid out before. An initiative, and then you attack, defend, uh, and then armor and critical hits. Wounds are, are not really going to happen there. Uh, talk it out. It says antics in combat can also include conversation. So perhaps you can talk. 
And then wounds and what those do, trauma and what that does. Magic and how magic works. Again, you get spells depending on your, your gift. And there are different ways of getting magic and different things that associated with magic or your magic associated with. And then the spells themselves. 20 simple spells that are all uh, pretty pretty usual, but there's some great names on the thingamabob, right? Back to bed, <laughs> fog, animate, glitter spray, poof, and fireball. Great, you know, tangle. Great little uh, abilities here. Uh, then you have uh, wondrous items and relics, magic items essentially. Herbs and mushrooms, because of course there are the herbs and mushrooms in a game about princesses and potions. And enchanted weapons. And then the monsters. And the monsters that they have in here are great. They're pretty straightforward, simple little stat blocks. The giant spider, the ghoul, the rot goblin, vampire, bat, gloom, wisp, hounds. All really creepy stuff, but then you have things like the big bad wolf. <laughs> right, the unicorn, of course. Uh, the dragon, henchman, baron, hedge witches, the mama bear, the huntsman, the knight. And the evil queen, because of course there's an evil queen. Right? The, the potential end of every princess is to become an evil queen. And then there's a monster maker, along with curses, because again, with the story about princesses, of course you're going to have curses. Strangers, fairy folk, what's for supper, how's the weather, treasure tables, and an ew, what's that table. And then an example of play. Now at the end, there's an introductory adventure, the Rosewood Crown, which is pretty straightforward, very simple, but a great little adventure with goblins and a giant spider, and what you might expect. And uh, an evil prince who is just looking for love. And... Uh, what happens if they complete it. Monster stats for this particular adventure and treasures and items. Also, there's a, uh, an example for a campaign, and it says here's a, a region, just a quick map of one, but then you can talk about how to get around it, cross the river, location, landmarks, various inhabitants you could have, rumors you might have, and random encounters you could have there. And then further reading, acknowledgements, and a license. Last couple stuff is you have a great character sheet here, really flavorful, be fun to give to your players. And then a notes page and the final back page. So Perils and Princesses is a great little game. Uh, I will put a link below. I don't think it's it's available for purchase generally yet, but it will be uh, fairly soon. I just wanted to give this a quick overview because I think these three games are all very small, um, but they're they're small in different ways, and they they approach the roll under um, quick, you know, uh, kind of do-it-yourself RPG indie RPG from very different perspectives. Mouse Ritter by this point has been around for quite a while, but Electrum Archive and Perils and Princesses is more new. They're both, you know, they're both in the process of being released pretty much. So um, I, I recommend all three. Great for collectors, but they're all fun and, again, fun in very different ways. Electrum Archive is a great system. Perils and Princesses probably is not for most people's tables. Um, maybe none of these are for most people's tables, but they are great to have. And, and I, I, you know, I, I give props to the creators of all three of these because they're really cool, really cool games for what they're doing. All right, guys, that's it. Hope this has been interesting. I'll talk to you later. See you around.